Let us pray. I give you the same opportunity as a believer priest to prepare yourself for the study of God's word. You can't study it under carnality. Evidence would be personal sin. It could be mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue, revert sins. We ask you to confess those through your priesthood prior to study and privacy so that the Holy Spirit can teach us the truth about our morning lesson. First John 9 would be an appropriate verse. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, our Father, we come to you today with a request from one of our brothers out of Dallas, Texas, who is now making a journey over into Mississippi to an aged family, parents. And it always seems like we're always behind the curve. That's in human terms. The truth of the matter is only God is ahead of the curve in the reality of life and death. The request, Father, for the family and for this woman has suffered a stroke in her up in age. We pray, Father, for a great medical staff around her. A staff that doesn't look at her age, but rather for her life. Don't make decisions based on her age, but on her health. Give the families that have to travel in uh, safety. Give them great ministry through this. So we bring this prayer before you as well as our morning service and Rick's trick, trip. All the preparation that's necessary. Prepare the hearts in Liberia. We claim that, that nation for Christ. That's a lot of pastors that need the truth that could win that nation to Christ in a heartbeat. If they can get on the page of the gospel and the grace. So we pray for that. I mean, what a great opportunity to establish that as a beachhead of importance for the Christian church. So we lift that before you as well today in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, open them to John. We're in a study on Truly Truly out of the book of John because John introduced, as we have told you, introduced a new teaching technique of Jesus that John caught when Jesus doubled up the truly, the verily, verily, or truly, truly. Uh, he doubled the amen. Other passages, other like Matthew and Mark and Luke and people like that, they talk about it. They use a truly I say to you. They don't use the technique that John saw that was important, doubling up on it. And what he noticed was that when uh, Jesus did this doubling up, amen, amen, or truly, truly, I say to you, an important messianic doctrine was delivered. So we have taken that and we've gone through the book of John, chapters 1, 3, 5, 6, 8, 10, 12. We're into 13. Now, when we get into chapter 13, we're into what's called the Last Supper and we're in from our discussion, the upper room discourses. And that goes from chapter 13 through 17, the Last Supper. Therefore, there are seven of these. I think in, in total, there's 25. Seven out of 25 are at the Last Supper. This is the supper before the crucifixion and uh, at Passover. And... It, therefore, these seven doctrines that are taught will be very important, not only for the crucifixion of Christ and, and the fulfillment of the messianic doctrines of the Old Testament, but they'll also be important to the church 
because this is where the church is going to be, be born through the death. If you understand Passover, you've got to have death, you've got to have burial, and then from his resurrection, you got 50 days to Pentecost, and there you have it. I mean, Pentecost is the birth of the, of the Christian church and a new dispensation, a whole lot of things is being born. So these, I think these seven will be important. Uh, this is the third of seven that we are in discussion about. It's the Sobayan ceremony. This is a really important ceremony that was done at Passover. It probably gets little print, but it was an important one. At least Jesus, the, John records that one of them, one of these truly, truly, I say to you, or one of the great Messianic doctrines was delivered, and it was delivered in, during the, the uh, Somayan ceremony. Now, the word, the Greek word, somayan, is a translation of the English word sop or morsel. And uh, that would be a piece of something that was dipped. It just depends on what it was, would be dipped into a special sauce. Since it's, la since it's the Last Supper and it's Passover, we understand that what is going to be dipped is going to be unleavened bread. And the special sauce, we're not uh, privy to, but probably a mixture of a bunch of different fruits mashed up so that there was a lot of juice with it. You, you dipped it in there in, in a juicy, probably fruity type of thing. There are many views on it, but that's one of them. Um, so... This, this part's about, so we're looking at our passage in 13. Notice my point number one is I, I do, broke it, I broke this passage down according to what my study I was after, the Somayan ceremony. And so I begin with verse 21, which is our truly, truly. When Jesus uh, had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, truly, truly, I say to you, that one of you will betray me. And so, he is already, now, he, the, the troubling here is not going to be like the troubling he's going to have in Gethsemane. In Gethsemane, his trouble is going to be about the crucifixion, the cup of the blood of Christ. What he is troubled about here, he makes, listen to it again. Jesus said, uh, when Jesus had said, said this, verse 20, which was earlier, truly, truly, and he has been dealing with betrayal, look at verse 18. In verse 18, he quotes Psalms 41, 9. He says, he who eats my bread, a close friend, has lifted up his heel against me. See, and so what is troubling him is that one of his 12 disciples, one of his 12 is going to betray him. That's what's troubling him is in his spirit. He's troubled in his spirit. Um, then in verse 22 through 25, a conversation breaks open between Peter and John, a private. Now they're seated at the table, right? And so a conversation the disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. There was reclining on Jesus' breath one of the disciples whom he loved. We assume that's John, the writer of the book. Simon Peter, therefore, gestured to him. He gave him an eye contact kind of thing, you know, at the dinner table. Reclining, reclining. Peter gestured, gestured to him and said to him, whispers to him, tell us who it is of whom he's speaking. Do you have any idea who this could be? He leaning back, thus on Jesus' breast, said to him, Lord, who is it? Verse 26 and verse 27 are dynamite verses 
on our truly, truly. Because you're going to see who is the culprit behind betrayal of Christ. And it would always be this way. But it says, verse 26, Jesus therefore answered, that is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. In other words, I'll give you a sign. I'm not going to tell you who, but I'll give you a sign. Okay? It is going to be the sign. Now, normally, you just pass the stuff around and they dip their unleavened bread in the sauce and it would go around and a person would eat it. Here's what, every once in a while, in a Samayan service, the host of it could honor one person by dipping it and giving it to that person. He would be an honored guest. That's exactly what Jesus did. What Jesus did <clears throat> was he took the, the sauce and the bread and dipped it and gave it to Judas. Do you understand the difference? Rather than passing around and each person dipping, then there would have been no clue. <clears throat> so this is unique. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon. Is, is, and after the morsel, Satan then entered into him. <clears throat> Look at that. Not a demon. Not a demon. The big man himself. It's a big deal. Satan then entered into him. Jesus therefore said to him, what you do, do quickly. <clears throat> Who do you think he's talking to? If you know anything about <clears throat> Jesus dealing with demon possession in the past, he always speaks to the demon. He tells him to get out. He tells him to go in the pig. You understand? <clears throat> I mean, does Jesus know that Satan just indwelt him? Of course he does. <clears throat> and he says to him, and he commands him, listen, here's the point that's good. He says, do quickly. It's an aorist imperative. That's a, that's a hut to command. He commands him, go, go do what you're going to do and do it quickly. <laughs> that's interesting. Then verses uh, 28 through 30. Now, no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. <clears throat> They're confused about why Jesus said, commands him what you got to do. They're at the dinner table, and they're going to come up with all different kinds of ideas. And not, of course, none of them. For, for some were supposing, because Judas had the money box, he was the treasurer, that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have need of for the feast. Or else that he should give something to the poor. Where did they come up with that when the question was, who is the one who's going to betray us? And Jesus says, it'll be the one that I dip the morsel and I give it to. Right? Now that's pretty simple, isn't it? Listen. Listen to me now, it's important to class. If you're listening. <laughs> if you're listening. Was anybody listening to Jesus during this supper? Is anybody listening? No. They're all there. They got their Bibles out just like you. And you look at me like you're listening. And how would I possibly know? by what you get from the word of God and how true it is to your soul. These are his hand-picked guys. They ask him a question. He gives them the sign that a, a baby would get. I could tell this to Ben, and Ben would figure it out. He's three. 
this is, doesn't take a genius, but it takes somebody to pay attention. And how important is that for you in Bible study? Don't let your mind travel off to other places. It doesn't. You didn't bring your mind in here to let it float to other places. You brought your mind in here today to study on the truth of the Word of God. So concentrate. Do not lose your concentration. In the midst of this lesson, God will speak something to your heart that you do not want to miss. If for no other reason, at least get that. And listen what their speculations were. They went off the charts. They shouldn't have went off the They guessed gobbledygook. You know why? One is thinking this, another's thinking that, another's thinking this, another's thinking that. None of them should, they all should be on the same page. A three-year-old could have picked up the sign. You know why? They're not listening, and they're not listening because they've got false assumptions. And false assumptions lead to false interpretation that leads to false expectation that le le leads to false application. And there you've got the stained glass 12. And they got the best teacher in town. And it doesn't matter. <laughs> Listen. The disciples are really struggling how any one of them could be this guy. And here's their false assumption. They believe that everybody at that table is saved. Like you look around the room and you think probably everybody in this room is saved. How would you know? Not everybody sitting at the table of Jesus were saved. They assumed that everybody was saved. Here's a second false assumption. They assumed that everybody said at that table were fellow disciples. They weren't because one of them was a betrayer. And in the end, they will all betray him. That's a second false assumption. They don't realize that because they don't pay attention in Bible study. They go to Bible study just to check it off. Here's a, th a third false assumption. They thought, and he does hold a high position on the team. He's the treasurer. And Jesus assigned that position. So they, th they think he's one of the top guys. Jesus assigned him that because he's got a problem with money, and that's going to take him. Listen. Before he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, he was stealing from the treasury. He was, he was knocking off on the money deals. One, it would come in and he would, take, he would take part of it away and say, well, this is, what is, this is what we got. This is how much was given to us after he took what portion he thought he could get away with. Here's another false assumption. Here's another false assumption is that he was a champion of the poor. That was his front for stealing. A champion of the poor. Listen, the only person he was a champion of was Judas Iscariot. The only person he really cared about was himself. And if you spent any time with him, you would have known that he was self-centered, egotistic, and whatever else you want. And here's the worst thing. He was the master great pretender. A pretender. Fake it till you make it. That's, that was his motto of life. Fake it till you make it. This is their false assumptions. What they should have done is listen to what Jesus was trying to teach them. It's not about who, how you perceive other people. It's about how you perceive yourself, people. Because you need to see yourself and be honest with how Christ sees you. Phony baloney. 
Either you're the real deal or you're a phony baloney. You see what I grew up on? Here's the second thing. You know, in John 6, I put this on your paper. Uh, in John 6.46, in John 6, 46, Jesus told him, there are some of you who do not wish to believe. <laughs> some. Was he being courteous? Must have been grading on a curve. In, in the sixth chapter, verses 70 and 71, he told them, I chose 12, but one of you is a devil. I would have been thinking that they would have been thinking about that. He said that in John 6. We're in John 13. It's not like he hadn't given them heads up several times. You know what I find in this that's important for me is the faithfulness of the teacher, not the unfaithfulness of the students. I needed that. I needed to hear that. My ability to teach, my passion to teach, my content to teach, all of that's based on my relationship with the Lord and not with the sheep. My faithfulness is towards him, and you're benefited from it. Here's the second thing. During the, the Somayan ceremony, Jesus gave his disciples a design of the betrayer, clear cut. Peter and John, they engaged in this private conversation, which he has already told them. In verse 18, he's already told them this. He's told them at the Samayan service, this is the fulfillment of Isaiah 41, 9. At the Samayan service, that's the reality of what he said about dipping the morsel in the, the, in the sauce. He, he, now the reality of the fulfillment of Isaiah 41.9 is the Samayan ceremony. We didn't know it from Psalms. We know it now. So it becomes, and now he says, at the Samayan service, the one I'm going to dip the morsel in and give to, which means he's going to honor somebody, and that somebody that he honors is going to be the betrayer. Jesus answered, this is the one whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to. You didn't normally do that unless there was a honored guest is the only time you did that. In other words, if it was just family and just something. But Jesus made a big deal about this. <clears throat> and it's worth noting. Notice the two parts of the sign, the morsel and the man. It's not complicated. Not complicated. A little kid who pays attention could have got this. Number three, the Samayan ceremony involved the, those seated at the Passover meal that occurred on night, always on Nisan's 14. A piece of lemon lemon bread would have been dipped into a special sauce, listen to me, for fellowship. What was the, Pumayan, the Somayan service ceremony? It was about the fellowship of the redeemed. The, you know where Passover comes from? Listen, this is what's missed. People don't pay any attention to history, biblical history. Listen, the Passover comes out of Exodus 12. You know where you put the blood over the doorpost? Passover? It, listen, Jesus, it, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, that Jesus Christ hanging on the cross is the Passover lamb. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. That's what it was to the Exodus generation. It wasn't the lamb's, lamb's blood. It was the blood of the lamb that pro, was a profile of their Christ. It was the blood of Christ. 
That's why Passover in the 12th chapter of Exodus in verse 11, it's called the Lord's Passover. It's not called God's Passover. It's called the Lord's Passover. That is, the one member of the Godhead that's visible. It was for fellowship of the redeemed. The Lord's Passover goes back to the Exodus, is celebrated. The Somayan ceremony celebrated the joy of fellowship of the redeemed after 400 years of bondage to, to Egypt. Acts 7, 6, 1 Corinthians 10, 16 through 18. Here's something you miss. You know when you take part in the Eucharist? Here's what you miss. It goes all the way back to Passover, and Jesus, it goes to the cross, and from the cross to the Passover. Agreed? Oh, please tell me you know that. Yes. Jesus Christ hanging on the cross is the Passover lamb of Exodus 12. All right. The cup of the Eucharist, both the cup and the bread, are you with me? Is to be given with what? Thanksgiving. Right? Well, that's why we call it Eucharist. The word Eucharist means giving thanks. You know where that concept came from? It came from the Exodus. That's the point of the Somayan ceremony of the Passover meal. <laughs> it was the joy of entering God's rest of grace through Christ. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, John 1, 28, Behold the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. This is Hebrews 4.11. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. Matthew 11th chapter, verse 28-29. All who come to me, come to me all ye who are weary and heavily laden. Now what? I'll give you rest. What is that rest? the rest of grace. That's the rest that comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ, when you believe that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, when you believe it, you enter into that grace rest of God forever. <laughs> this Somayan ceremony was all about that. And he hands that to Judas, who is broke, who has broke that tradition by being a betrayer. When Judas accepted the sop that Jesus offered him, when he accepted it, he became the betrayer rather than the follower of Christ. Now let me tell you something. Satan had, hadn't entered him yet when he handed him the sop. He hadn't entered him. Well, you didn't pay any attention to the reading. Where were you? Where were you? You was right with the disciples. You weren't paying any attention. Look at verse 27. After the morsel, Satan entered him. Why is that important? Because of volition. When Jesus handed that to him and looked at him and handed that morsel to him, he could have handed it back and said, I, not, I don't want to be a betrayer. I am the one. I was wrong. 
I need to be a I desire to be a follower of Christ. I want to be a believer. I don't want to be a betrayer. I want to be a believer, not a betrayer. Could have passed it back. Jesus, this, listen to me now. This is the last appeal. This is the last personal appeal he will get from Jesus to come on in. And this is a wonderful appeal. This is all grace. No works in it. Doesn't, go, doesn't say, now you're going to have to jump through a whole bunch of loops. Listen, he looked at that man and said, I know who you are and you know who you are. You can come back. You don't, this don't have to go any farther. I say that to you. At some point in your life, you've got to choose whether or not you're going to get into the program. You're going to follow God's will to the very end or you're going to play this phony baloney stuff you've been playing in your life for so long. One day you're up for Christ, the next day you're down. You're down. Why? Because you're the big deal. As long as you're the big deal in your life, your life will never be honorable to Christ. You're a yo-yo Christian. Up one day, down one day. Up one day, down one day. Listen, the Christian life is to be consistent. He, he gives you the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to beat the flesh. He gives you the word of God so you can walk it by faith, by grace. When you, when, whenever God tells you this is grace, is, uh, tells you to act by faith, is because grace supports it. Grace always supports faith. And never works. And Judas is all about works. He listens to it. He talks the talk and can't walk the walk. Don't be a phony baloney. Don't be a phony baloney. Let me tell you, behind your closed doors of your house, God knows who you are. You're a phony baloney. God, you can't hide anything from God. Don't you know that? You can quote the essence box. How come you don't know that you can hide nothing from him and you shouldn't want to? You should be an open epistle read by all men. You wonder why Christianity is not winning anymore? You know why people in your family are just falling off by the wayside? You know why people no longer want to come to church and listen to the truth? The same reason for the disciples. They're phony balonies. They talk the talk and can't walk the walk. I'm looking for people who want to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. I'll get rid some more today, apparently. Stop being a phony baloney. Listen, Christ paid the enormous price for you to live by grace through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God. Your life every day is a gift of God's grace. Every day. I don't care what kind of day you're having. It's a good one if you know God. But every day is a gift. You should live it to the max for Christ. Let me tell you, I don't want to be a pastor of a religious group. I could do that. I've had offers to be pastor of religious people. Neither one of us would last. Because I'm a grace man. Not a works guy. When Judas accepted the sop, he became a betrayer rather than a believer. At this moment, he became the son of perdition, a son of destruction. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, Jesus said, which you have given to me. And I guarded them, and not one of them perished except the son of perdition, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. He said that in John 17, 12. At this moment, Satan indwelt Judas. After the morsel, Satan entered into him. And Jesus said to Satan... Do, and he command him, do what you got to do and do it quickly. Let you know that was bold. 
So when you hear that prayer in Gethsemane, he's already started that engine running, right? Whatever that prayer in Gethsemane, it's not, boy, that engine, he's, that train's left, left the track. Or wherever, the train, wherever that train's going. Judas had made a previous deal with the Sanhedrin to pay Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And listen, he could have gave that back. He could have went in there and preached Jesus Christ and tell him why the 30 pieces of ill, why he wasn't going to betray him, and that if they came to the garden, he was going to be standing with Jesus rather than kiss him. That betrayer walked into the garden and told the police, the man I kiss is the one to arrest. And that guy walked boldly because of Satan indwelling, walked right up to Jesus Christ and gave him a kiss, and it was over. That's what it is to be a son of perdition. And let me tell you, if you read Matthew 27, 3 in your Bible, and it says repent, change that word. Because what he did was not repent. What he did was feel remorse. It is not the word metanoia. It is the word metamelomai. It means regret. You know what he was filled with? The guilt of legalism of his do-gooder stuff caught up with him. That do-gooder stuff. Sold Jesus out to gain the, the, the honor of a bunch of legalists. Sold Jesus out for a bunch of legalists. Because he was a do-gooder. A do-gooder. That's how I'll get to heaven. Be a do-gooder. I'll be a religious do-gooder. Metabel, I regret. He regretted betraying Christ. Didn't repent. He had his golden opportunity and he didn't do it. When Jesus handed them sop, he could have handed it back and said, no, I'm not going to do this. Because Satan wasn't involved in him then. Not indwelling. Here's a point of interest as I close. The Bible records two people indwelt by Satan. You know what's interesting? Both in the Jewish age. One, Judas Iscariot. One, Judas Iscariot, in the period called the incarnation of Christ, and the other is the dictator of the arrived Roman Empire in the tribulation of the Jewish age. You can read this in Revelation 13, and you can read it in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3, especially verse 3. And they, these, both these men in the Bible are called sons of perdition. In Mark, the 14th chapter, verses 20, 21, Jesus tried to warn him. He said, woe unto the person who betrays me. Woe. Now listen, a woe is about as bad as it can get. A woe means if you don't stop, wrath will get you. Woe. He said, better for that man if he had not been born than to betray me. That's a pretty tough statement. You know where the dictator of the Roman Empire went? Lake Fire. As a son of perdition, he went to the Lake Fire. It's on your paper at the very bottom.